The Bible teaches us that God's mercies, or the chance to get it right, are new every morning. And maybe after the year we've had, I'm sure there are some things in our lives that need some attention, some things we need to make right. Maybe you found yourself stuck in some unhealthy patterns, or perhaps life hasn't gone exactly to plan and you feel at the start of this year, you'd like to do things a little differently. Then why not join me and together let's hit the reset button so we can claim the new beginning that God makes available to us. Uh, it's so great to see you all this morning, so great to be here. You know, I love this church and I love you and uh, I'm just so thankful that, um, <clears throat> that Pastor Rob and the elders have given me this opportunity to, to uh, speak with you this morning and in a message that I, that I hope and pray would uh, bless you uh, and that ultimately would lead to um, your joy. So that if this, this morning, really, this message all is, is about resetting uh, that understanding of of joy, and um, I just want to firstly say thank you to Pastor Rob, who's, uh, I, don't, I don't think as a church we really honour him enough and, and give him, you know, uh, say thank you enough to him, and we just really love you, Pastor Rob, and we, we thank you for everything that you do for us and for me personally as well, so I just really appreciate you and, um, yeah, just everything about, you know, what you do for us, Pastor Rob, and I just really thank you, so... Um, so if you're visiting with us, um, as, as over the past month or so, we've been going through this uh, sermon series on uh, reset, and the idea is that uh, we want to reset some of those things in our lives that perhaps we've learnt over the past couple of years. Uh, you know, it's been a pretty, pretty uh, rough couple of years going through COVID, and we just want to reset some of those ideals and some of those fundamentals that maybe have, you know, gone astray a bit and maybe have gone off course a bit. And we want to bring them back and realign them with, um, with, realign them with Jesus and what he teaches us in his word and, and teaches us through his gospel. And so this morning, this message, as I said, is all about resetting, uh, resetting our joy and where is our joy and, and um, where does our joy come from. It's been a bit over a year now, I think, since I've last spoken with you out the front. Um, it's been a bit of a crazy year, hasn't it? Um, and, you know, it's just it's been so special for us as a family, you know, uh, watching our little two-year-old over there grow up. And um, she's, <laughs> she's not the most sociable two-year-old in the world, but um, she's, she's beautiful. And, um, you know, just my lovely wife over there as well, Hannah. And we just, um, I'm so blessed. Um, um, yeah, just so blessed to, to have them in my life. So, uh, God is good, right? Yeah. God is good. I don't know how you're feeling this morning, but sometimes it's difficult to say that, right? God is good. Uh, all the time, that's right. God is good all the time. But sometimes I, I feel that it's difficult to say that. And, you know, as Pastor Rob really prayed this morning, you know, some of the things in our world can start us questioning that. Start us thinking about, you know... Uh, where is God in, in, in some of these situations? But we know and our, and our hope and our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we're not careful, if we're really not careful, some of these things can really start to um, affect our joy. So would you join with me this morning? And, and this morning I'm going to be reading from um, John chapter 15, verse 1 to 11. But before we get into that, would you just join with me as we pray, as we pray and um, invite God into our service? Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to come before you now and just thank you, Lord, for helping me prepare this message, Lord. And, and ultimately, Father, you know I've been praying this all week long, Lord, that this message is, comes from your spirit, not from my own words, Lord. And I just pray that what I've, what I've written down in this page, Lord, that um, you would take that and you would mold it and, and you would speak to people through your spirit, Lord. We just want to uphold you this morning, Lord. We want to love you. We want to honour you. And Lord, most of all, we want to glorify you, Lord. So this morning, as, as we just pray for this message and we pray for this service, so we just thank you that you are our Heavenly Father who, who delights in his children and loves to give us good gifts, Lord. And we just thank you, Father, for everything that you do for us. In Jesus' name. 
Um, Before I really get into John chapter 15, as I was reflecting on this idea of what it means to... um, what it means to reset our joy. I was challenged by um, a couple of verses um, that you're probably all too familiar with in the Bible. Um, <clears throat> firstly, this one in James chapter 1, verse 2, that says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Or perhaps this one that says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look to these verses, I start to think maybe I'm not a very joyful person, right? I start thinking um, I'm not a very joyful person because here they are, here's James, first of all, and and Paul, second of all, writing about how, how they find it, to be pure joy when experiencing trials and tribulations, or Jesus found a pure joy to uh, endure the cross for us. And so I start to think to myself, you know, maybe I'm not a very joyful person. And I've obviously got things to be joyful about, a beautiful wife, uh, a beautiful two-year-old, and uh, a little announcement, and a a second child on the way. And um, we're just... (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) and so I've got plenty, I have plenty in my life to be joyful about, but I, when I look to these verses, I, I start thinking, you know, maybe I'm not a very joyful person because I don't find it joyful to go through trials. I don't know about you. I don't find it joyful to go through tribulations. And uh, I can assure you, I've never experienced it, but I would not find it joyful enduring the cross. But here we are challenged by these verses um, about finding a pure joy in, in these situations. And so my understanding and the Bible's understanding of what, what joy is is clearly two separate things, you know. Uh, perhaps my joy um, looks a bit more like this. This is my understanding of joy, right? This is an emoji. If you, you, everyone familiar with emojis? Uh, some people, some not. Uh, this is the uh, joy emoji. So if you're texting someone, you would send this message and that's communicating uh, joy. But this is what I would come to understand and what culture has taught me that joy is. is just this next level of happiness, right? It's this next level. It's like you, you're, you're content, you're happy, and then when you go beyond that, you're joyful. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that Uh, joy can be found in those trials and tribulations. And so I'm really challenged by that and and convicted by that. Uh, I can can say, honestly, I've only probably ever cried um, over joy twice in my life. Um, Once when the uh, Patriots won the Super Bowl and and secondly, when they won it again. No, I'm just just kidding. Um, Now, firstly, um, firstly, when... uh, you know, marrying my beautiful wife, and then secondly, through a very tough, uh, very taxing uh, birth for our little one. And I just want to share with you that story just briefly. Um, when Hannah was about, when Hannah was giving birth to Madison, she was, it was a pretty long labor. I mean, I don't know really how long labors are meant to be, but I assume, uh, you know, nine to 10 hours. I don't know if that's long or not, but uh, it was about nine to 10 hours into labor. And um, the, the, nurse kept, the, the midwife kept reminding us, you know, Hannah, you're almost there, you, you, you're right, like you're right on the edge, you know, you're right on the edge, you're so close, you know, keep going, keep, keep uh, you know, keep breathing, keep uh, working, you know, doing those things, and um, she, she apparently was really close to giving birth, and then, and then all of a sudden, um, the heart rate that was, the little device that is meant to monitor Madison's heart rate just stopped working all of a sudden. We're not really sure why, what happened, but you know, the doctor said that may have lost contact with her. But um, for some reason, right, two to three minutes, her heart just, there was the, the screen that was showing her heart rate just stopped. It just wasn't showing anything. And then um, they tried a few things. They tried to get Hannah to shift positions and move around and try all these different things, but um, nothing, was, nothing was really happening. And... Um, you know, there was this, this moment of like, then all of a sudden, after two to three minutes of just trying these things, and then 
<laughs> within 15 seconds, all these hospital staff just rushed into the room and I was kind of like shoved over to the corner in the back corner there and there was, this, um, there was nurses, there was, you know, doctors, there was, you know, anest anesthesiologists, is that right? Um, uh, just all in the room and they just kind of rushed her out, you know, to get an emer emergency caesarean all, and it just happened just so quickly in front of my eyes and, and I just remember thinking like, you know, this is supposed to be that moment of just absolute joy in my life of, you know, the birth of your daughter. But all of a sudden there was this, this moment of just, um, it was gone. That joy that I was expecting to be feeling at any moment was, was gone. It was, it was taken from me. And, and I wonder if that's a little bit how sometimes we can feel, you know, that we're expecting to experience and, and feel joy but then at any one particular moment that's kind of just gone and I came to the conclusion after a lot of uh, prayer and searching that I really didn't understand what joy meant I really didn't get what the Bible the Bible's version of joy was I, I had this cultural understanding but not a biblical understanding so as we get into the text, I want to begin by really refocusing and resetting um, our thinking on, on what joy is. And I want to take you to the heart of what it means to experience true biblical joy. And I believe the key to understanding, experiencing and resetting our joy is, can be found in this text. Now, in saying that, I want to be clear that some of this message may sting a little bit. It may sting a little bit. But believe me when I tell you this, I would not be sharing it. I would not be sharing with you some, some personal difficulties. I wouldn't have prayed for you earnestly. I wouldn't have spent hours over this message if I wasn't totally convinced that this message can and will lead you to a place of true biblical joy. Notice, though, I, I did not say happiness because joy and happiness are not the same thing. You get that, right? They're not the same thing. They never were intended to be the same thing. And, and I just want to explain that for a moment. Everyone has, I, I know you have experienced one of those days that I was just talking about where the weather was perfect, the sun was shining, the birds were chirping, you know, the kids were just playing together nicely outside and, you know, they were, they were lovely. They were hugging each other. They were playing so perfectly and so, so beautifully. The dog was just nice and, you know, perfectly just laying down calm on the, you know... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden, something happens, right? Something happens. Someone makes a comment. Someone says something. Uh, something happens in our life. You know, we might get cut off while we're driving or that rude customer comes into work or that boss is critical of what you've, the work that you've done. And all of a sudden, that joy that we were experiencing or that happiness we were just experiencing is gone, right? The dog may... Um, chew on the furniture you've just built or something like that. Uh, <laughs> it's a little reference to Pastor Robert there. Um, you know, and all of a sudden, that happiness we were just experiencing is just gone. And so I came to the conclusion that we can't control happiness, can we? Happiness is uh, really a reflection of our circumstances, an understanding of you know, all the different things that are present in our life and we can either feel happy or not. And then if we're not careful, uh, we, we, that happiness can lead to disappointment and that disappointment can lead to frustration and that frustration may even lead to anger or, or perhaps even worse, that happiness uh, resulted in tragedy and then instead of happiness, we're feeling sorrow and, and pain and bitterness. So let us start by resetting or, or, or re-understanding our thinking about what biblical joy is. And um, um, so yeah, happiness is an emotion dictated by our circumstances. 
And for at any point, for any one reason, we can uh, experience those emotions. And at different points in our lives, those emotions are perfectly valid, right? Happiness, sadness, disappointment, anger, these are all emotions um, that we can and will experience throughout our life. I mean, Jesus experienced these himself, right? He was sad over the death of his friend Lazarus. He was angry over the people in the temple courts. He was disappointed in his disciples in the garden. Yet joy is different. Joy is not an emotion, and the Bible teaches us that it's not an emotion. And joy uh, actually is an aspect of one portion, uh, one section of the fruit of the Spirit, right? And so joy is evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And so Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So unlike happiness, disappointment, sadness, or even anger, which are dictated by our circumstances, joy is not an emotion, but a reflection of the work of the Spirit in our own lives. Yet our society would tell us otherwise. We are told that joy is just that next level of happiness and dependent on your circumstances, you may experience you know, times in your life of joy. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. Joy is not an emotion. It's evidence of the Spirit. So please hear, please hear me when I say this. If some of this message is difficult to hear this morning, the purpose in it is not for you to get a temporary boost to your levels of happiness. Because I believe that happiness is cheap. And what I mean by that is there will be times in our life where we will experience one thing or another that will take that happiness away from us. Our circumstances will change and we will experience times in our life of of disappointment, of frustration, of anger, of sadness, of, of tragedy, of sorrow and of pain. And that happiness will be cut away from us. It will be stripped away from us. Through all the heartache and through all the loss, through all of our fails. And what I meant to say is that You know, at different points, we'll experience one of those things in our life. So my prayer for you as we we enter into uh, John chapter 15 is not for you to get a temporary boost to your levels of happiness, but rather you would come to know and experience the work of the Spirit in your life. And that despite those circumstances, you can see the fruit of the Spirit growing within you. So I hope that's clear and and I hope... um, uh, Hope that the Spirit will work within you through that. So John chapter 15, verses 1, it says this. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. And as I read this passage, you know, I don't want to pause at every sentence, and I believe we could for this passage because it's just so jam-packed full of imagery and, and um, context. And, you know, uh, for context for this passage, it's... Um, it's Jesus is about 24 hours away from being arrested in the garden. Okay, so keep that in mind as we go through that. that this is about roughly 24 hours before, right, he is about to be arrested in the garden. Okay? And it's really important that we keep that in mind as we go through this text. But here it says, I am the true vine. And perhaps that doesn't mean that much to us today. I look at that and I go, okay. I probably never really you know, seen that many vines in my life. I probably haven't, you know, worked on that many vines. I don't really know what this word means. But for first century Jewish people, this verse, this, this image of the vine was loaded with imagery, right? The true vine. And so um, throughout Old Testament history, God would constantly refer to his people, Israel, as the vine. Right? He would always refer to them, or not always, but, but regularly refer to them as the vine. And every time he did, uh, it was coupled with, it was associated with um, a, a, a declaration or a rebuke that they were a vine that did not bear fruit. 
It was always a rebuke. It was always a, you know, you, you, you were meant to be the vine, but you were not faithful. You were not producing fruit. You were meant to be my people, the vine, but you're not producing fruit. And so it was loaded with imagery. And, and, and so when, when they probably, I, I don't know for certain, but when they imagined, that, and when Jesus said this, they're probably thinking that every time they've heard the vine, this is a declaration or a rebuke of judgment. It's a, it's a, it's a verse that really God is judging. It's, it's a proclamation of judgment, of, of rebuke. Yet Jesus, I love Jesus, and here he is turning that idea on its head. He's flipping it upside down for us. Um, and so Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I am the true vine. In other words, he's saying, I am going to be what you could not be. I am going to do what you could not do. You were a people that could not bear fruit, but, but I can. I will do for you what you were unable to do for yourselves. I will be for you what you were unable to be for yourselves. I just love that. So good. And so Jesus is entering into this banner, this identity, this, this understanding that, that of failure and disappointment. Because that's what they would have thought of when they heard of the vine. Disappointment and failure. But Jesus is saying, no, I am the true vine. You have not been able to be fruitful in a way that pleases God, but I am. So that no longer do they have this image of failure, but an image and a reflection of the perfect saviour. You have failed, but it's okay because I am. He is rescuing and redeeming this image of failure. And so, really, the first key or the first point that I want to make in, in understanding um, how we reset our joy is to recognise who he is and not necessarily just what he has done, but first of all, we need to recognise who Jesus is. He is the true vine. And so secondly, John 15, verse 2 to 3, it says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. I think this line here is especially difficult to hear. It is for me anyway. It says, those who do not bear fruit are taken away. And in other words, and when we look on further ahead, uh, we'll realise that it's, uh, this is actually the opposite of union with Christ. They're cut off. They're no longer in union with Christ. They're being cut off. However, I think the difficulty comes, uh, that the added difficulty comes in the second part that says, every branch that is in me that does bear fruit may What? Be pruned. And if I'm honest with you, I wish it didn't say that, right? I don't like that. <laughs> that doesn't, it doesn't really fill me with a great sense of uh, happiness, right? Um, that if we bear fruit, we can expect to be pruned. I would much rather this verse said something like, be blessed. Oh, great, Jesus, thank you. I, I will be blessed. Thank you. Um, but as we learn and as we go through the text, what it actually means is to be pruned is to be blessed. Yeah? They don't necessarily conflict with one another. In fact, they are perfectly in unison with one another. And so what does it mean here to be fruitful? And I don't... I don't know where this happened throughout church history, but somewhere along the line, I think we've misunderstood this idea of being fruitful. Um, we've, we've applied it to multiple areas of our lives um, in ways that the Bible never really intended. So what does it mean to be fruitful? Does it mean we're going to have great careers? Does it mean we're going to have lots of good quality friends? 
Does it mean we are going to have a nice house with a well-behaved dog and, and, and a beautiful yard? Does it mean we're going to go on plenty of holidays? Does it mean we're going to be well-liked and well-received at all times? And when we say it out loud like that, it sounds silly, right? We know it sounds silly because this is not at all what the text is referring to. It literally tells us to, that we are to expect to be pruned, but somehow we've associated this word fruitful with all these other different things in our life. But that's not what the Bible is intended. We apply it to our wealth, our status, our friendships, our possessions, and we tell ourselves we are being fruitful. We are being fruitful with our money. We are being fruitful with our time. That's not what the Bible teaches us. In fact, to be fruitful is to continuously grow in the fruit of the Spirit, right? That's what the text means. It means to grow in our love. It means to grow in our joy. To grow in our peace. And and maybe the most difficult one, to grow in our patience. To grow in our kindness. To grow in our generosity. To grow in our faithfulness our gentleness, and to even grow in our self-control. So when Jesus said he will be what he could not be, he is, when Jesus said he will be what we could not be, he accompanies that with he will prune us so that we can be more like him. Yeah? And so he will prune us so that we grow in these areas. And not just one of these areas, but all of these and if we read the text really carefully, it's, it's, it's quite clear that it says the fruit, meaning singular, meaning that we are to grow in all of these areas, not just a few of them. You know, you can't be loving if you're not patient. You can't be kind if you're not gentle. You can't be joyful if you're not also generous. And so with this is understanding that this fruit grows in in unison with each other, that as one grows, the other grows with it. They grow symmetrically together over time, like a like a you know a, a new plant growing out of the ground, you know, spreading out over time. And so we read this and and, and my understanding is that I am not once I, where I once was. I'm a lot better than where I once was, right? But neither am I where I want to end up. I'm still growing in this pathway to where I, I, I hope to one day, end, one day end up. And so day by day, the spirit within me is growing this fruit. And as I reflect upon my own life, I can recognize the times of greatest growth also, were also the times of greatest difficulty. It doesn't mean I'd like to go through those times again, but uh, I recognize that growth, that those times brought growth And that helped me to be more fruitful. He pruned me so that I would grow. He pruned you so that you would grow. He prunes us so that we would grow. And so I I don't know about you, but I, I still have growing to do. Right? I think we all still have growing to do. So the Lord, in his kindness and in his love for us, prunes us so that we would grow so that our joy may be complete. And so, number two, the the second key to experiencing true biblical joy is that we must expect to be pruned. The joy and pruning go hand in hand. They're not separate from one another. And so John 15, 4 to 7 says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, He is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, 
Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And as I read this section that I like to call this, this little this section here, and Jesus repeats himself a few times, but I like to call this section being in union with Christ, that I am in him and he is in me. It's not just me and him and he, or him and me, it's actually both, that I am in him and he is in me. And I'm struck by the fact that this is 24 hours away from Jesus being arrested in the garden. And I've never really thought about that before, but this is 24 hours away from Peter denying him three times. This is 24 hours. I, I, I can imagine, I don't know for sure, but I, I can't imagine that Jesus is looking each disciple in the eye as he, as, he, as he goes through this. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. And if we know the story of the garden, we know that the disciples, Jesus gets arrested and they what? They flee. They run. And Peter perhaps, you know, might get a bit of a raw deal in, in the telling of this text, but, you know, clearly denies Jesus three times. But Jesus, so full of love and so full of grace, is emphasising to them how essential it is to remain in union with him. This union of I am in you and you are in me. That I abide in him and he abides in me. So that when God sees us, he no longer sees us, sees our failures, but instead he sees the perfect obedience of Christ. Even more than that, Jesus is emphasising that to be in union with him infers this deep physical, spiritual and emotional intimacy. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I don't feel that all the time. But I should. That if I'm abiding in Jesus, I, I, should, I should know this intimacy, this, this closeness with Jesus. That union with Christ would be all-consuming. That our desires, our passions, our time, our mission would be Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And that's why the final verse says, Ask, if you remain in him and he remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Because knowing that if we remain in him and he remains in us, then our desires are his desires. And his desires are our desires. And so it's not asking for whatever, you know, I'd love, Jesus, I'd love a new boat, right? I'd love, a, I'd love a new house, right? It's not about that. It's about that if he is in me and I am in him, then our desires are the same. Our passions are the same. And so my, our prayers would be the same as well. And as I begin to reflect on this passage some more, I'm, again, I, I get drawn back into Peter. And I, I want to analyze this for just a few moments because isn't it human nature that when we offend someone, we avoid someone, right? Um, I reminded a few times growing up when, <laughs> I mean, always my brothers and sisters, never me, all right? But a few times when I, I did something wrong, uh, mum would sometimes say, wait till your father gets home. Right? And I'm sure my sister's really, really, you know, um, got a bit concerned about that. Never me, never me, it's fine. Um, but um, it was this, uh, mum would say that, and, and my response would be, I'm going to go hide in my room. Right? I'm going to go hide in my room because the hope is that if I avoid this situation long enough, maybe it'll blow by, right? It'll just kind of pass me by like in the dead of night, you know, ships passing in the dead of night, and it'll be okay. But that's human, isn't that human nature that when we offend someone, we want to avoid them? And so Peter is 24 hours away from denying Jesus, and I can imagine, you know, that maybe Peter would want to avoid Jesus afterwards, right? He's denied him three times, but... but 
you know, this, this beautiful story, you know, really comes into conclusion in John 21. And that's not at all how Peter responded here. It's actually the opposite. Peter was on a boat and Jesus was walking by on the shore and Peter recognizes Jesus and what does he do? He jumps off the boat into the water and he swims up to Jesus on the shore and throws himself at his feet. I mean, that to me is, is so beautiful. And that's what it means that, to abide in Jesus, that we, wouldn't, that we wouldn't hide from him, we wouldn't avoid him, but instead in recognition of our failures and our mistakes and our shortcomings, that we would come before him and throw ourselves at his feet. Because Jesus loves you and loves you intimately. And so the third key to <coughs> the third key to resetting our joy is to remain in union with him. And perhaps uh, this next verse is um, I love this next verse. It says, "By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples." I, for the longest time, I overlooked this verse, and, and I encourage you to not do the same, that we can really learn from this verse because by this, Jesus has said all these things to them, all the, everything that's come before, Jesus has said these things so that the Father is glorified. And I don't know about you, but I often read this story and I made it all about me. I made it all about me. I go, where am I growing? Where am, what am I doing? What am, what am I? But Jesus is saying, like, it is, a, it, is, it is about you, but more than that, I am saying these things to you so that my Father is glorified. We bear the fruit of the Spirit, not for only for our own gain, and, and, and there is some gain in that, but ultimately the purpose that we grow in the fruit of the Spirit is to glorify the Father, right? So underneath all of this is that ultimately we become more fruitful, not for ourselves, not for our own gain, but for the glory of his name. So that truthfully, all of these things, it's not actually about us. The motivation, the purpose behind all of these things about abiding in Christ and him abiding in us is that God would be glorified. That his care for you, his love for you, his passion about you, really the motive behind all of that, isn't that we're great, it's that he is great. Yeah? And so, this was such a, just a, just a revelation for me. And, and, and God makes this point over and over and over again in the Bible that he, he's doing these things, you know, yes for us, but more than that, He's doing these things for the glory of his own name. I've read this before, but I've never really gotten it before. This was game-changing for me anyway. Now, we're going to see it over and over and over again in the Bible in a way that God makes it abundantly clear, and he is not ashamed to admit that. That I am doing this for the glory of my own name. Just as the fruit of the vine brings glory to the vine dresser, so does the fruit of the Spirit bring, bring glory to the Father. And so the fourth key to resetting our joy is to live our life for the glory of God. That's why it is written, let everything you do, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do for the glory of God. That's really hard sometimes, isn't it? very difficult sometimes to do that, but all for the glory of God. And then finally, uh, the last few verses. Oh. I think I've done something wrong there. Um, last few verses says this. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And there is a cycle of dependence here. And because we don't fully grasp our position in God, we can end up misreading the text here. 
We can end up misunderstanding what is actually written here. And we start reading it as, if we obey his commandments, then we will love him. But that's not what the text says. The text actually says, first, abide in my love, then you will obey my commandments. Right? And so, if you're married, then I I think you have a a really good picture of this. And uh, often, uh, Hannah will say uh, something like, can you can you do the dishes or, you know, something like that. And really when she's saying, hey, do you feel like doing the dishes? This is a bit of a, just a bit of a warning. For you. This is a bit of a trap, right? If you say, if, if your wife says, do you feel like doing the dishes? She doesn't actually mean if you feel like it, right? <laughs> it took me a long time to learn that, but it's a bit of a trap. Um, what she actually means is, hey, it would be really appreciative if you would do the dishes for me. I didn't get that at first, and, and so I would respond with, no, I, t- I really don't feel like doing the dishes. And she would then respond with, well, say something like, uh, well, I wouldn't want you to do something you don't want to do, you know? Great, I'll see you later then. <laughs> but what is interesting about this is, As my love for her grows, I sometimes actually find myself wanting to do the dishes, right? You know? As my love for her grows, I actually, you know, sometimes want to do the dishes. Unless she's done some baking and there's like 17 mixing bowls and eight spoons, then, uh, I'm sorry, that was a bit of a a passive-aggressive statement, so um, I apologise, Hannah, forgive me. no, but, you know, I actually find myself wanting to do the dishes because my love for her is growing and so out of that I actually want to do things that will help her. And she's a much better model of that than I am, to be honest with you. Like, I'm really bad at that. Hannah is really good at that and it's really irritating, right? <laughs> she's really good at going, hey, what can I do to help you today? What can I do for you today? She's really good at it and probably, I imagine, learned that from her from her parents, but I'm, I'm still learning, so you know, be gracious with me as I grow. And so what we learn here in these last few verses is that I am called to work on and to grow in my love for Jesus. And out of that, I will end up obeying his commands because my love for him is growing. Not to work on my obedience so that my love grows. It's actually the opposite. Work on my love so that my obedience would grow. So therefore, I want to fill my life with the things that stir my affection for Jesus. I want to spend my money, my energy, my resources, my time on the things that grow my desire for Jesus. Because out of that... I know that my obedience will follow. And so that my joy may be complete. And so the final verse is to keep growing and abiding in his love. So the five keys to resetting our joy is, one, we need to recognize not just what he has done, but who he is. Number two, we should expect to be pruned. Number three is we must remain in union with Christ. And number four, our life is lived for the glory of God. And then finally, keep growing by abiding in his love. So in conclusion, you know, I, want to, I really wanted to draw this back in and, and you know, how do, we, how do we apply this to our lives? How do we, what, what do we do in response to this? And I think a great place to start is to start paying attention to those things that stir our affection for Jesus. What are those things in our lives that really stir our affection for Jesus? For me, I love to study his word. I love to unpack his word and and really dive into the text. And and each new verse kind of brings something new. I love that. I just love that time. And, you know, I don't do that enough, but I really love that. I also love having close, intimate prayer sessions where people are vulnerable and honest. I love that. That stirs my affection for Jesus. 
I love epic narratives and fantasy stories. And I love testimonies. You know, especially, you know, testimonies of people throughout history who faced with great obstacles and great, and great um, you know, opposition. They still let the love of Jesus shine through. I love that. That stirs my affection for Jesus. But on the opposite hand, I need to avoid things that diminish my affection for Jesus. Things that may, you know, diminish my love for him. And if I'm honest with you, I can't watch too much TV. I don't think TV is evil or anything like that. And, you know, there's some really great programs on TV and, you know, I think it can be a really great time. But I, I personally can't watch too much of it because some because the shows I enjoy watching or the shows I like to watch... Um, often make me numb to the things of God. I start getting entertained by things that would break God's heart. Things like violence. Things like sexual immorality or impurity. Things like idolatry or witchcraft or jealousy or fits of anger dissensions and divisions, these things, I start getting entertained by them and so I need to be really careful about how much TV I watch because I know it diminishes my affection for Jesus. And instead I need to focus on the things that stir my affection for Jesus. So my challenge to you is that as you go about your week that you would start asking the question and start paying attention to what is it that stirs your affection for Jesus? And likewise, a much more difficult question is what is it that diminishes my affection for Jesus? What am I doing with my time and my energy that is actually robbing me of that love for him? And I guarantee you, he will show you, you just might not like the answer. Yeah. Yeah. And so as I wrap this up, I, I, I had this statement that I just really wanted to conclude with that says this. So as I really begin to recognize and understand who Jesus is, I know that my joy is the growing fruit of the Spirit. And so that I may grow more and bear more fruit, I expect to be pruned. As I stay in union with Christ and he is in union with me, I do all things to glorify the Heavenly Father. Abiding in the love of Jesus so that he may correct my disobedience and therefore complete my joy. Amen.